friend to me over the last couple of months. And, you know, I was disappointed that she wasn't able to, to clinch the nomination this time around, but she ran a really great campaign and has just been, uh, you know, she, I'm from Fredericksburg originally, from Spotsylvania County. And so uh, she actually, um, you know, was, was vying to in part represent uh, part of the, the Commonwealth where I grew up. So excited to see it. Um, but just the same, one of the first things she did is she reached out to me and she said, I want to connect you with this awesome group and, uh, and I hope you'll be able to talk to them. And then she said, tomorrow. And I was like, well, let's <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> if, if Angie said so, then I'll, I'll do my best to make it happen. So what I want to do, I just want to introduce myself quickly, uh, give you a little feel for, for me. I mentioned I'm from Spotsylvania, but there's a little bit more to the story than that in terms of my, uh, my path and then tell you about why I'm running for Congress, why I think we've got an awesome opportunity here uh, this November. So uh, again, I'm Cameron, I'm a, I'm a physician, I'm an internal medicine doctor at the University of Virginia. So I'm a hospitalist, which means that I only take care of people when they're admitted into the hospital. It also means that since March, my group has been responsible for taking care of all the, the coronavirus patients at oh. the University of Virginia Hospital. So, so that's kind of been what our group has been, been doing. I just of service yesterday, it's one of the last four days. But, um, but that's part of my job. I'm also a lawyer. So I, I have, I'm a health, health law expert, uh, health policy expert. So that's my background. And, uh, and so I, I took a pretty long path uh, professionally to make sure I had some training so I can do some real good in this world. And, uh, and for me, um, that path took me, yes, through my education, through my training, it also landed me in the White House. So in 2016, I worked for President Obama in the White House. Uh, I was on the White House healthcare team. Uh, and that was just a phenomenal experience. I was the only doctor on the White House healthcare team in 2016. And we were working on implementing the Affordable Care Act, this law that had gotten 20 million people insurance uh, that had just really revolutionized people, you know, lower income individuals access to healthcare. And I was excited to do that work and to help out. And it was a part of the White House fellowship. And uh, it's a prestigious program, uh, kind of, uh, you have the opportunity to work at the highest levels of government. So there's only 16 of us selected every year. And we're working with the senior most members in every department. And I was blessed to, to work in the executive office of the president. So I got to work closely with President Obama and his team. I also worked on his My Brother's Keeper initiative, which was aimed at improving life outcomes for boys and young men of color. So I always tell people my work for the last 15 years has lived at the intersection of health and social justice. I genuinely believe that the issues and access to care, that's a social justice issue. That's a civil rights issue. Uh, you know, Dr. King once said that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. And so to me, I take that to heart. I say that, you know, that's a, Dr. King knew a thing or two about injustice, and yet he, he said, that's the area, that's the thing that's the most shocking. And it's the thing we still haven't solved. And so that's why, you know, in large part, that's why I got that law degree, so I could do that advocacy work. And that's something I'm passionate about doing. And so you're probably wondering, well, how does that land with you standing on a Zoom call in front of us talking about running for Congress? And for me, it's that every day when I'm taking care of my patients, you know, once your eyes are open, once those scales are removed from your eyes, you can't, you can't miss out on what you're actually seeing. So the patients that I'm taking care of, uh, I'm not just seeing diabetes or high blood pressure or lung disease anymore. I'm seeing the issues with access to prescription drugs. I'm seeing the insurance that people should have but don't. I'm seeing my opponent saying that he would repeal the Affordable Care Act, which would cause 400,000 people in my Commonwealth to lose their insurance. And I just know how devastating that would be. And so from my standpoint, I know I have a responsibility, right? As a doctor, I took an oath, first do no harm. And, and that means a little bit more than just not doing bad things. It also means keeping bad things from happening. And so that looks like making sure we have laws in place to make sure that everybody in this country has access to healthcare. Um, now, I, I wanna be really clear on what that means because people try to read between the lines. There's a, you know, I'm, I'm new to politics, so to speak. And, uh, and I've noticed that people try to, no matter what you say, they try to put you in a camp one way or another. Uh, are you a centrist? Are you moderate? Are you progressive? Whatever that may be. I'll tell you what I'm in favor of when it comes to healthcare, and that's that every single person in this country should have access to the care that they need, and they should have access to that care of sufficient quantity to where it can be effective for them, and that accessing that care should not result in financial harm. Those are the three things. No matter what, that's what I'm passionate about, and that's the working definition of universal health coverage. And I bring that up because that's what I teach. At the University of Virginia, I'm the Director of Health Policy and Equity. So I teach all of the medical students all of the public health students, I teach them about 
health policy and our health system. And I have a deep knowledge and understanding of it. And I recognize there are some people who say, hey, single payer is the only way to go. And I often tell people, hey, there's a chance that a single payer system is the most equitable and just version of healthcare that we can accomplish here in the United States if we do it right. And then I also hear people say, well, you know, a, a public option, that's the right next step. That's the right path forward. And what I say is there's a chance that a public option can really help close those gaps if it can achieve universal health coverage. The thing that I know is that every single person in this country needs to have access to the care they need now. This isn't something that can wait for us to debate, to debate this for the next four years or eight years or 10 years. This is something that needs to happen now. There are 30 million Americans without insurance. There are 27 million more who may be losing their insurance because of this coronavirus pandemic and the job loss that we've seen with it. We have over 7 million undocumented individuals in this country who don't have access to the care that they need. Our responsibility is to make sure that if you're in this country, you've got access to the care that you need. And what I know as a health policy expert is I've got a lot of tools that I could use to accomplish that, you know? And so I, you know, somebody, uh, I was talking to a Washington Post reporter last week and she was like, well, what you're proposing sounds pretty unique. And I was like, well, I'm not beholden to anybody's plan. What I'm beholden to is the best path forward. So I, what I believe it looks like is this, for those 30 million individuals, if you told me on, in January of 2021, well, what to do next? I would say, let's get them insurance right now. <laughs> Public health insurance option, let's get them insurance right now. Everybody who, who needs access to care. What that does is we can actually index that to their income. So no matter how much money they make, because there are some people who are uninsured but make 500% of the federal poverty line. Because for them, they don't qualify for those Affordable Care Act exchange subsidies. And so that's why they're uninsured. There are other people who are uninsured because they make less than 100% of the federal poverty line, but they live in a state that didn't expand Medicaid. Those are situationally different people. We can solve both problems with this public health insurance option right now, right? We can do that with the Senate as it's currently composed. We can do that right now. And so what I say is my patients can't wait. That doesn't stop us from having the argument moving forward, but I mean it. My patients can't wait. So let's get those people covered. Along the way, we have to make sure we're preparing our system to go through the real transformation that it has to go through to actually work for people. And so the next thing that I say is we've got to break the bond between employment and health insurance. And so we have 40 million plus individuals who've lost their health care coverage uh, because of, or who've lost their jobs rather, because of this COVID pandemic. And I say there's no time like now to kind of come to that conclusion that your job shouldn't determine your health insurance. That's a mistake. That is a vestige of World War II. That was a design flaw, and it's something that we're still paying for. I call it the original sin of American healthcare. And so from where I sit, I'm like, this is our time to end that relationship. Employers can still contribute to your healthcare. We call that defined contribution plans. You can still contribute to somebody's healthcare, but that allows every individual in this country, the 150 million plus who have insurance through their employer, it allows them to make a decision do I want the public plan or do I want to stick with private insurance? And I'll tell you why that's important too. And so that's, that's an important piece because when we break that bond, individuals get to make their own, plan, their own decisions. And that idea of autonomy, that's quintessentially American to a lot of people. To a large segment of the population, that's an important part for them. I know I'm talking a lot about healthcare. I can't help it. I love this stuff. And this is so, such an important issue. So, and I, I'll talk about other things too, I promise. I, I'm a fast talk. But, um, but that's the second piece, right? So, so breaking that bond between employment and insurance, the second piece is private insurance should be a nonprofit endeavor. And when I say that, people are just like, huh, that sounds pretty radical. And then I tell them Blue Cross Blue Shield was nonprofit until the mid 90s, right? This shouldn't be a radical concept. If you are insuring people's health and well being, you shouldn't be doing it so that you can make a profit on the other end. Any profit that you make should go back into making a better product. That is something that should just be the design that we have. And that's not original. That's not an original idea. We do that in other countries around the world. So that's the second piece. The third piece is payment reform for healthcare providers. Right now, the incentive is to just do more things. You do more, you get paid more. You do more, you get paid more. That creates a problem. Instead, you should be paid for value. We call it value-based payment. Um, and what happens is if you achieve certain quality outcomes at the lowest cost possible, the money you make is the difference. It encourages efficiency in the care that we deliver. That's how we can address our, cr our crisis of pricing in American healthcare. So those are the three main components because what that allows us to do is to set the stage for what other, whatever kind of intervention we wanna make in the future. If people all vote with their feet that they wanna to go to a public insurance plan, well then we can do that. And that can become our single payer system and we already have the groundwork laid. 
If people say, you know what, that public plan, that wasn't working for me, then we didn't just commit 330 million Americans to something that wasn't working for large segments of the population. What I know from doing equity work for a long time is that a rising tide never lifts all boats. You know, we like to say that, but it just doesn't. And so we have to make sure we right size healthcare and we make it, you know, malleable so that it works for different segments of the population. And I don't think you do that by snapping your fingers. You do that by being really thoughtful, really deliberate. We've spent the last 100 years trying to reform healthcare. And as you're hearing me talk, I hope you're hearing what expertise I'm bringing to this conversation. It's the reason why uh, Senator Kamala Harris endorsed our campaign and Representative John Lewis and, and the House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn all in the primary. And the reason was they said, every time they called me, they would say, we need your expertise in Congress. We need your leadership on this. I'm not just going to Congress to be a backbench freshman. I'm going to help lead in a critical conversation at a critical time. And this is usually the point in the conversation when people say, all right, are you some kind of one trick pony? You only got one issue, it's healthcare. And I tell them, you know, first off, that's not a small issue. It's one fifth of our economy, right? We spend one out of $5 in this country on healthcare. It's the largest employer in America. So don't minimize it. Healthcare is a huge deal. It's the defining issue of this election. But beyond that, and, and that was before COVID, but even more so in the setting of COVID. That includes public health preparedness. That includes reducing the cost of prescription drugs. That includes getting mental health access for people or reproductive access for women. That is a critical, it is the issue of the 2020 elections, guarantee you. But beyond that, what I tell people is the rest of it is really rooted in what I say is my true north. It's equity and justice. And so when it comes to, to big issues, we have few that are bigger than our climate crisis. The fact that we are behind the eight ball on addressing that crisis. And as a scientist, I look at it from a data standpoint. I look at it from an evidence standpoint. And we have more than enough evidence to tell us what we need to be doing. And that's moving swiftly and decisively to move toward a clean economy to decarbonize as quickly as possible. And in fact, you know, our, our kind of fossil fuel economy is falling apart before our eyes. The costs of clean and renewable energy is, is now cheaper than a lot of these other, these other mechanisms that are, that are driving so much damage to our, to our world. And so we're fighting for, for all these policies. We're not gonna oh, no. address our climate crisis. And that's a big deal to me. Um, and so, and then the, the last thing I'll say, so climate's a big one. The last thing I talk about is economic mobility. I say everyone should have chances for health and for success. And that success piece usually operates through education. And I, I joke that I went to the 25th grade, so I know a thing or two about education. You know, I spent a lot of time in school, <laughs> but along the way, I learned a lot about what those elements are that create opportunities to succeed educationally. And those don't exist in all counties and all school districts. And we need to make sure that's the case. Uh, also, criminal justice reform is huge. Long before the murder of George Floyd, I've been talking about the critical need for reform at every step in our criminal justice system, from policing and the apprehension of a crime, to uh, the decision of who to prosecute, to adjudication, to sentencing, to corrections, and then to reentry. Once people have paid their debt to society, they shouldn't have to pay it for the rest of their lives. That's, a, that's an epidemic that's disproportionately impacting people people who look like me is it's really negatively impacting our society. Hey, sorry about that. Um, and so I think with all of that said, those are the issues I talk about the most. Those are critical issues. And those are also issues that are built for a moment like this. I'm a, I'm a Christian by background. I always, I always talk about my faith because it helps to explain to people my worldview. And in the Bible, uh, there's a story of, of Esther, who was a queen. She had a cousin named Mordecai, and he came to her, and there was a lot going on to her people. And what he said, she was saying, I don't know if I'm supposed to be the one doing this, delivering this message to the king. There's great risk to me. And what Mordecai said uh, in, in Esther 414 was, maybe you are appointed to this position for such a time as this. And I look at this moment in our history where we're facing crises in health and crises in social justice, and I think about the path that I've walked to this moment. And I say, it's important for me to be loud, to be honest, to be authentic in a moment like this, to bring a voice like this into not just this race, not just Virginia's fifth district, but also to our national discourse. So I'll close by this because I want to take some questions, but, but I'm running for an open seat. The current member of Congress, uh, he was beat by uh, an, a challenger in his primary, uh, they had a convention that was designed to get him out. It's not that there's broad support for this other guy, it's that the party leadership wanted somebody who was really far to the right because of the hubris of the Republicans in my district. They thought that they could run somebody as far to the right as they wanted and this seat would be safe. But immediately, pundits changed the seat from a likely Republican seat to a leans Republican seat. 
my opponent had only had about $39,000 cash on hand. I've got about $400,000 cash on hand. Oh, my opponent, good. my opponent talked a lot. <laughs> he <laughs> talked a lot about being a biblical conservative and how those are the values that define our district. But y'all heard me quoting Esther. I know the Bible. My father-in-law is a pastor here in this district, and I know that the Bible also talks about our, our responsibility to our fellow citizens. It talks about caring for folks who have less than. It talks about loving everybody, right? And those are things that you can't just pick and choose your scripture. We are just called to be good people to the people around us. And so I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe for him. I'll go verse for verse, and we can see who wins this argument about what, what, what Christian values are in this particular district. At the end of the day, my opponent says this is a bright red district. But what I know is that the data tells us it is not. And he's in for a, rude, for a rude awakening. If he tries to run this race purely as being a bright red conservative, I'm gonna take all of, the, all of the deep blue, all of the light blue, all of the purple, and some of the light red. All of it's gonna be coming in my direction. And the reason is because people want somebody who's rational, who's thoughtful, who listens to other people, who's willing to work hard on their behalf, and that's me. And so I'm looking forward to this race. I think in November, we've got an, an awesome opportunity to flip this seat. It was just added to the red to blue list, so it's one of the, the key marquee seats in the Democratic Party, and I think we can get it done. But it takes folks like you who aren't even in Virginia who are saying, hey, we're ready to work, ready to help out. And I only lived in Baltimore for one year. I lived in Maryland for one year <laughs> right before I moved back here. But uh, hey, if you all want to adopt me and help out in any way, that would mean a ton. So with that, I'll stop. I know I went over time. Great. But I'm just enjoying you. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I am from Finland. Uh, and I am thrilled that you're talking about a single payer system or universal health care because that's what I grew up with. And it works. Finland also has the private insurance if you want to have a go really fast. Right. So, but it works. It, my family has gotten all their stuff. My mom had breast cancer for 10 years. She whined about her taxes. So I said, how much are you out of pocket for all your 10 years of 120 bucks mm. for 10 years? So wow, wow. it can work. We just need to use our taxes for something else. I, one thing I'd like to do is clone you <laughs> so we can get more candidates like you because you're exactly the kind Hello? of candidate that we need. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what I'll tell you about the single payer thing is that I, I have these conversations every single day. And what's important is that I know a lot of people in my district who are terrified of that idea. And so part of what we're doing, part of where we are in this transformation is we're making them understand what we mean by government providing insurance to individuals and showing them that, that works well. They understand it with Medicare, right? They're like, oh, Medicare, but you earned that. They understand it with Medicaid. They say, well, folks who don't have the resources should have that support. But the thing is, the people who are left out right now, it's causing so much harm to our society, to our workforce, to, to our well-being, to educational opportunities. And so realistically, that's an investment in the health and well-being of our society. Now, I love how you pointed out that in, in Finland, it's both you have the, the government insurance and private insurance. And I think that people need to understand we're not anti-business, but what we're saying is that the government has a role to play, and that role is in making sure that everyone has access to the care that they need. And if there's a way for industry to innovate and to also provide something that people choose, then that's a different thing insofar as they still have what they need, no matter what. And that's the key. That's the key. And, and if you are really interested in uh, taking care of families like they do in Finland, you're, when you're truly family oriented, there when you go have a child, your prenatal care and have given birth to a child, it's all paid by your taxes. You are not out of the money. So no matter how poor or rich you are, you don't have to worry about it. And that's taking care of the children and the mothers, which I see that's not happening in this country for the poor people at all. Yeah, 100%. Okay. All right. Does anybody have anybody else have questions for Dr. Webb? Dr. Webb, uh, and uh, your high, <laughs> uh, your what is they call lawyers, your majesty. <laughs> How did you end up being a doctor and a lawyer? You're so young. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm older than I look, but you know what they say. They say black don't crack. That's something yeah, I'm it don't crack. <laughs> uh, Oh, I'm cracking. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm 37 years old. So I That's accept, I, you know, it's, I'm still young, but I think that it's, it's an energy that I bring to the race. I also bring a lot of experience. Yes. Yes. Having worked in a lot of spaces and having worked in the federal government. I'm on the Medicaid board here in Virginia, appointed by the governor. So I have experience at the state level 
at the federal level, and then I'm the director of health policy so awesome. at a major university. So it's just, you know, I bring a lot of real experience uh, in addition to kind of the, my youth and my energy and my ability to engage. So it's a, it's a good combination, I believe. Hank, you had a question? Yes, uh, I just actually had a statement. Mississippi governor signed a bill changing the state flag and abandoning the Confederate yeah. symbol. Yeah. 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 And all I, right. Well, in, in here in my district, there are Confederate flags all over. And actually in my hometown, there's a huge Confederate flag that flies over the highway when you're passing by Spotsylvania, Virginia. Same is true when you get down to Danville. And so, you know, I don't think people realize, I remember I posted a video on Twitter once and I said, as soon as I saw that flag come over the horizon, my heartbeat quickened, my blood pressure I know was rising. That, that feeling that I have, that's a chronic stress that I experience in this society. And we don't need that, right? I understand people make an argument that it's something about culture. It's actually oh, yeah. something that has a very different effect. And so I think yeah. Georgia made that decision years back. I'm glad Mississippi made that decision. Um, you know, the people who carried that flag killed the people who, who carry our flag. And I think we just need to keep that in mind. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's someone without an arm that was buried somewhere over there. We're going to re reconnect the arm and just put him in the dustbin. That's it. I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have questions for Dr. Webb? I've got, I've got a question for Dr. Webb. Sure. You're on the front line for uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic at uh, the hospital. What's your, uh, what's your view on how Vir Virginia is complying with the federal guidance, and uh, what's the the outlook that uh, you see it from your point of view? I think, I think, you know, it depends on what part of Virginia you're in. So Northern Virginia was having a little more trouble. There, there was more COVID in Northern Virginia, um, the Richmond area. Um, but I think uh, the biggest challenge that I see is that we're getting a little too comfortable too fast. And I think that, uh, you know, we're in phase two right now. We're supposed to enter phase three tomorrow, which means that restaurants are going to be open for more dining. More people are going to be out and about. And that just happens to coincide with the 4th of July holiday. And, and I'm watching what's happening in Florida, in Texas, and in Arizona. And as a public health professional, I'm a professor of public health sciences, all that evidence is telling me that we don't need to be opening back up to the same extent that we're doing right now. I recognize the economic pressures. I recognize that it's challenging. But I also know what happens if we go back to a standstill. If we go back to something like a phase one, if we have to shut down our communities again, that's devastating. My hospital was losing $85 million a month back in March and April. And because of that, I took a 20% pay cut despite being on the front lines, right? They were laying off nurses and technicians, the or furloughing. You know, the, the reality is we can't afford to go back. And so, you know, the, the, uh, there's a statement that I like, it's slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? It's not about just doing it immediately. It's about saying, how do we make sure that we're getting those fundamentals down, that, that identification, that isolation, and that contact tracing? Those are the keys. And I think that we're still working that out. We're not testing enough individuals. You know, we've tested about less than 8% of the United States population. <laughs> we don't know anything about COVID. We don't know where it is and who has it. And I think that that's going to be our big challenge because only about 20% of people have significant symptoms. We're missing out on so many people who have it. Uh, and so it worries me as a health professional. Um, I'm glad that my governor is a doctor. I think that he sees and understands it a little better, but I, am, I do feel like right now he's being pressured by the economic interests. And I think that at the end of the day, those have to take a back seat to the health interests. So you know, anytime you're opening, you have to keep in mind, you gotta have really clear metrics on when you're gonna pull back because 30 some states now are having an increase in cases. And why are we still moving forward? If we're having an increase in cases, that's the wrong direction, right? And I, and I think we need to do everything in our power to, to get that under control. I think from a congressional standpoint, moving forward, we need to have the public health preparedness. We need to make sure that we have the resources in place. So the next, and I, I wanna be clear on this, the next viral pandemic, because this is not the last one. Uh, this was just the, the next one. This was the unexpected one. We've been thinking we were gonna have an influenza pandemic and we still might. We might have one this year coming. No, there's nothing stopping from having that mutation be really devastating to our society. Are we more prepared today than we were last year? And the fact of the matter is all of our resources are stressed from COVID. The combination of COVID and the flu this year is gonna be incredibly challenging. And so the resources have to be there. You have to prepare in pandemic preparedness. Uh, and then beyond that, we have to make sure we have an ability to get testing where it needs to go. Um, 
I think people are trying to get back to business as usual. There is no business as usual. There's not normal again, not for a while. And we have to get comfortable with that. And, and the last thing I'll say is wear your masks. I don't know what's wrong with people, but, um, but I need people wearing masks when they leave the house. Uh, it's, it, people are getting way too comfortable. And, um, and for me, working in the COVID unit, once you see people, thank you, Hank, for showing me. Once you see people who are really sick from COVID, you don't take this lightly. You don't take it lightly at all. I just took care of a guy yesterday who's been in the hospital since early April. He just moved from the ICU to the regular floor on Sunday. Okay, when you take care of people who have that situation, it's a different thing. And so that's why, you know, maybe I use an abundance of caution, but it's coming from a place of deep experience. And no, that's not every person in our community, but it shouldn't be anybody. This is a young man who's 42 years old who didn't have any other condition. So, so we need to protect our society from that impact until we're ready to move forward. And so we can, you can deal with the economic ramifications. You can't come back from death. And that's what we've got to be on top of. Can I ask you a question? I Absolutely. know that I, I know that I want to adopt you. How can we, uh, how can, how can we yeah. help your campaign? Yeah, that's a question. Hi, Dr. Webb. Hi. Um, glad to meet you. Um, I am, I just passed a test as a test tracer. And I was just wondering in Virginia, how the trace, the test tracers, are, are you hiring? Are you? Yeah, we're hiring. If you go to the Virginia Department of Health website, there's a bar on the left-hand side that's like, we need thousands of contact tracers. We don't have nearly enough. Um, we are, we're in the midst of an outbreak right here in my community. And it's in, it's in the Latinx community. So it's a, a largely Hispanic community. And that's where disproportionately we see the, the burden of, of COVID in a, lot of, in a lot of communities. And yet and still, we're not effectively tracing it. So it continues to spread. And I think that there are a lot of populations, a lot of demographics in our society who, for a lot of reasons, are more invisible than others. And when you have a, you know, a pandemic that's concentrated in a Hispanic community where you have the overlay of the Trump administration and their threats to, to folks who are, who are accessing resources, their threats to individuals who would seek care, it's just going to continue to spread. So that's where that contact tracing is all the more important. Um, we've got to recognize this virus doesn't carry your immigration status. It's going to spread in our community. And so we have to do everything we can to get resources to the places that need it the most. And so that I think one of those resources is contact tracers. It's people who are saying, hey, let me dig in deep with you and figure out, you know, who may have been in touch, who may be at risk, because that's the fundamentals of pandemic preparedness. It's you identify, you isolate, and you trace. You identify, you do the testing, you isolate, you say you stay home for two weeks and some people are gonna need resources to do so. They're gonna need food access. They're gonna need income supports. They're gonna need housing in some instances for other family members so they don't spread the disease. You need to be prepared to, to provide that. And then you gotta contact trace. You gotta make sure everybody who may have come into contact also you're doing the same thing or else this virus is gonna continue to spread. We're not out of the woods yet. People don't, people don't acknowledge that, it's just factual. So it sounds like you may need uh, Spanish speaking contact tracers as well, right? You definitely do, definitely do. So Alan, you were asking the question I was kind of thinking of, how do we help, right? That was the question, yes. Yeah, well, you know, there's a couple of things. So uh, you catch me on a good day, it's June 30th, it's the end of our fundraising quarter. So, you know, we're trying to raise as much money as we can. I told you why, and the reason is that I've got an opponent who hasn't proven an ability to raise money. He's, he's you know, as of early June, he had about $40,000 cash on hand. We've got 400,000. Um, what I know is that he's gonna come out and try to label me, and you all have talked to me for 27 minutes now. He's gonna try to label me as an extreme radical leftist. Uh, he got yeah. My job is to be on TV before him, is to be everywhere before him so I can define who I am. So people hear me, they say, hey, that, that guy, he's, I hear what he's saying, he just seems pretty thoughtful, pretty, he's, he's coming from a place of evidence, of expertise, and I don't think he's a radical, right? I've got to get that message out before he does. And, I, and again, I'm going to cover the airwaves. There are five media markets in my district. So I'm going to get everywhere I can to make sure people are hearing this message. So the first thing is we've got to raise as much money as we can by midnight. If you all are able to help with that, please do, whether that's contributing personally or just making a post on social media or on Facebook or whatever it may be, sending folks to my page and saying, it's a big night for Dr. Webb tonight. If you can help raise some money, that makes a huge difference. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is kind of along those same lines. It's getting the word out. Um, we've had over 19,000 individual donors to my campaign because they're seeing the moment that we're in and they're just like, hey, there's something about this 
doctor, lawyer with a social justice background in the midst of the crises that we're facing, and we want to help get him to office. My district has, has, since 1789, when James Madison was the first congressman of my district, it's always been served by a white man. And I think that there are a lot of people who see my candidacy and they're like, oh, this is exciting, this is new and this is different, let's support uh, Dr. Webb, I think he's gonna win this race. I don't think people realize all the time how deeply rooted some of the sentiments are gonna be. There are gonna be people who are just gonna come out to stop a black man from winning in a district like this, you know? And that's something I'm acutely aware of, uh, you know? And so for me, I think the more we get the word out, you know, we. Do, a lot of time going around my district, meeting with people, connecting with people, spreading the word, whether it's via Zoom or now in some physically distanced uh, kind of small group environments. But, um, but the support we get from all over the country makes a huge difference. The average donation, $43 over the last quarter, right? So people are just giving what they can, but that adds up really quickly. And that's how we've had some really phenomenal fundraising days is people just spreading the word through their networks. And so do that. You know, we, I was on MSNBC earlier today. And then if you all see, you know, let's say you go to MSNBC, you see that I'm speaking and then you post it on your Facebook and then somebody starts sharing it. I guarantee you that turns into thousands of dollars for us every time you do that. So just get the word out. I think that makes a huge difference. Uh, I don't think I'm doing anything revolutionary. I'm just speaking my truth. I'm just speaking to the, from the perspective that I have and the expertise and the skill set that I have. And if it resonates with people in this moment, uh, like it's doing, then it's going to be a good thing as we head in. That's the next thing. And then the final thing, is, well, the final thing I'll say is just that, Again, this comes from my faith. Uh, if you're a person of faith, keep us in your prayers. I mean, it's, you know, politics are, it's a, it's a curious beast. And, um, you know, I've already had death threats on this campaign. I've had, you know, strange letters coming addressed to my daughter. There's a lot going on uh, oh, down here in Virginia. But, you know, I, get, I, I always, it, it's unfortunate. But one thing I told my wife, I said, all my heroes got death threats. So, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, when you're creating and pushing for real and meaningful change, there are going to be some haters. There are going to be some people who don't like what you're doing. Um, we're going to be safe in our campaign, but there's nothing safer than, than your covering, than the blessings and the prayers. That makes a huge difference. So if you're, if you're able to, or if that's part of your, your value set or your background and you're willing to help, um, that's a great way. Just if it crosses your mind, just send up a quick prayer for, for my family and I. Yeah, and I see you have a beautiful family on your website. Yes, yes. That's yeah. my real family, too. I didn't, those aren't actors that I hired. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are just too cute. All you and your family are just too cute. Thank you. Uh, Alan, um, I, I just wanted to make sure that the, that the um, link that you have for Dr. Webb under her, under, on our agenda is the one where we can go and donate. Uh, Dr. Webb, can you tell us your website? Sure, I'm, I can drop it in the chat also. So it's uh, www.drcameronweb.com. So okay, I, yeah. yeah, we got it. It's on our agenda. Yeah, it's on, yeah. it's on our agenda, good. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, we got your back. I love it. Okay, wow. Well, well, it takes a nice village. Nice to and, meet and I, you, Ms. Dr. Webb, Honorable Webb. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, the honorable, that would be the honorific, you know, when I win in November. So let's let you guys can invite me back this time next year. And, um, and you, you can, uh, you can drop that honorable on me. But until then, uh, I'm just honored to have your engagement, have your support. Uh, you all are, are fantastic. I love the energy. You got me all excited this evening. So thanks for, for, uh, for just creating a space for me to talk to you for a bit. And, uh, and let's do this together. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank Thank you so much, much for joining us. Yeah. My pleasure. Y'all take care. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Bye -bye. Hello to the family. I will. I will. Y'all take care. Bye. 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 All right. Yeah. So I guess the next is the Montgomery County COVID update. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Host disabled attendee. Okay, who's the host? Oh, we have to enable you, right? Yes. Okay, what is that under share content or is that? No, no I, it's think under... Alan is, I think Alan's actually. Oh, Alan's actually the host. Right. So go ahead. Can you, you have control. share your yeah. screen? Thank you. Okay. Gail? Yeah. Try uh, again. Let me try again. I was trying to. It said no. Um, hmm. She's not able to share. I'm not able to share. What about? Well, try it again. Okay, I'll try again. Oh. All right, thank you. Okay. Craig, what are these? Is this my computer? Yes. <laughs> okay. Share. Hold on, let me um click share. What am I clicking? Oh, okay. 
Share. There we go. There is Zoom. Oh my God. Okay. So I'm going to go to the website that Alice has posted on, on the invitation. This is the data dash dashboard for Montgomery County. Gov oh, from the excellent. Government. Hello? Excellent. Okay. Um, so everybody can, can read just like me. The max cases we have thus far is 14,737 with 699 deaths. We get a very good report card. If you look at these numbers below, um, on a three-day average, it continues to decline. Uh, the average is 72 confirmed cases. Related deaths is only one um, in the hospital, correct? Um, it, everything is all declining um, today. So uh, let's see, um, related hospitalizations, 134 three-day average and it continues in a declining number. Um, emergency room patients, the three-day average is six. Uh, related ICU hospitalizations, 48, three-day average. Acute care bed, 66% um, three-day average. Uh, ICU, let's see. Tests administered at 1511, three-day average. Um, I think that's, Wonderful. And you, everybody knows that they can get a test, right? CVS. At, from CVS. Make an appointment. Or you can make an appointment at the Wheaton Library. Um, and not, from what I understand, it's a quick process. It takes 48 hours to get your results back. But anyway, uh, let's see. We're making progress, and some of our criteria is met. Is met. As far as testing capacity, Let's see, we, were, we met the criteria to leverage healthcare network providing testing to symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. We have accessible testing options across the county. Uh, we're still working on networks in place to offer high throughput testing. Uh, let's see, you can read just like, you want me to keep reading? We can uh, read it. Test, okay. Uh, let's see, we're still working on equity, compiling and using data by race and gender. I'm going to go down to the bottom and, and see what you guys think. But um, confirmed cases, they break it down by age, male and female. It looks like the, uh, we're catching up to each other, 510. Uh, what? Okay. Got comments from the gallery here. Uh, 18 to 49, 37, 89. I think that's that number's up, I do believe. Um, wow. Males, 37, 97, females. Um, 50 to 65, 16, 90, 15, 71, females. 65 plus, 12, 45, and 16, 36. There's more females getting the disease, or there's more females being tested and going to the doctor, because uh -huh. there's always people that don't, don't seek help. Um, as you can see, the number for males and females, zero to 17 is zero, that's good. 18 to 49, 26 males, 10 females. 50 to 64, 68 males, 19 females. 65, wow, 277 males and 299 females. This is what I want to ask you. Well, I'm not going to dwell on this, but non-Hispanic whites. What right. is that? Anyway, there's 326 um, deaths. Non-Hispanic blacks, 159. I think that means black Americans, but I'm not sure. Non-Hispanic Asians. Whoa, 65 deaths. And Hispanic is 128. Others, 21. There's a lot of nurse, nursing home cases and deaths. Um, nursing home, 22, 17 cases, 366 deaths. Non-nursing home, 12,767 and 282 deaths, totaling 14,984 just nursing home and non-nursing home. Let's see. Uh, okay, there's a lot of workers that are being impacted by COVID, as you can see. Um, 
Montgomery County employees, 721 were exposed. The numbers in quarantine currently are only 49 and 672 people returned back and are well now, which is, we're getting A pluses. However, from what I understand, we're going to phase three. Does anybody know the date? Are we going to phase three or are we holding off? We're holding off. We're holding, that's very good. I do have an article in addition as you know, since I've passed the test, I get every day, I get a newspaper from John Hopkins. Wow. So I thought it was interesting. Hold on, I'm going too fast. These are recommendations by a Dr. Inglis B uh, to slow the acceleration in places with rapid rising disease. And from what I understand, all but there's more than 30 states that are rising. Uh, currently in the COVID numbers. Um, he recommends that we, let's see, means better protections, they need more PPEs, they still need that. Um, states with consistently rising rates must adjust their reopening plans, uh, better educate the public about the risks of large gatherings, communicate to the public that mask wearing is required in public places and uh, ramp up diagnostic testing and contact tracing. And I'm really considering just getting tested um, even though I have no symptoms. And I think Craig to support and commend the work of their public health teams. As you heard Dr. Webb mention, a lot of the, uh, the health workers are being harassed by political leaders that this must stop. Let's see. Uh, and if you're interested, um, the World Health Organization has this article. Um, I'll, I'll provide the link. You can read it if, if you're interested. Um, 10 million people across the globe have tested positive for co coronavirus. Nearly 180,000 whom tested positive in the last 24 hours. Wow. Yes, half a million people have died worldwide. Uh, the United States, which accounts for about 4% of the global population, has nearly a quarter of the total confirmed cases, 2.4 million. That's a big number. Yeah. yeah. This is definitely not over um, by any means. And so I think our, our wonderful, I think, I believe our president has stopped us from supporting the World Health Organization, right? We can't make donations even if we wanted to. Is that correct? No, you can make a contribution if you wanted to. Okay. Well, he stopped large donations from um, companies like Microsoft and others. <clears throat> Which I find- It's time for a new president. It definitely is. And that's about, any questions? Probably not. Okay. Thank you. Probably. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, it was very interesting. Very well done. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna, I did have a quick question. Sorry, this is Dave. Um, about the phase three, are other parts of the state going to phase three? They said no. Or, well, I thought that was our county. Is it county or state? I think that's the state from what I understand. Oh, okay, that's the good. county is actually, holding back on that, but I think the state is entering phase three. Oh, okay, but Montgomery County will stay uh, that. I, okay. I, I wanted to tell you guys something interesting. I was on a Zoom about the reopening of the worship places, this for synagogues, temples, and churches, and they came up with this, uh, I don't know what it is, a calculation, I guess, um, that, for every one person, you can't have anybody else in a worship, a place of worship within 200 square miles. What? Yes. Square, miles. I know. Square, miles. square feet, square miles. feet. I'm sorry, square feet. <laughs> but but yeah. the, everybody went crazy on the Zoom, uh, of course. They said, how did you figure that out? And, and it, it wasn't explained well, but I'm still yeah, it's, the, it's the same for gyms. And we figured out that our strength training class needed a space 
3,000 square feet. Exactly. So we're going to continue Zoom. Yeah, so. It's, it's crazy. crazy. Alan, I think it's your turn on the 2020 elections. Okay, I'll be brief because we're almost out of time. I mean, we can mm -hmm. go to heaven, but uh, we should keep our meeting sort of under control. So I wanted to report that in the Kentucky Senate primary that uh, McGrath beat Booker. And that was an interesting race because uh, Bernie Sanders and AOC had, sir, had uh, endorsed Booker sort of at the end of this, uh, at the end of the race. He came very close, basically 45, 43%. Um, so that was interesting. Um, last uh, Thursday night, we had a meeting of the Maryland Democratic Party where we elected a new chair for the convention. So the state chair, Yvette Lewis, will be the delegation chair. We also uh, supported uh, a slate of Montgomery County, Maryland people to be on the platform rules and credentials. Yeah. And uh, there will be uh, there will be no in person convention. It's going to be Zoom. We've not heard uh, what the uh, what the logistics are are going to be for that. But we're going to have a meeting tomorrow night. It looks like, and we'll we'll have that uh, have that conversation. Uh, two more things, um, as you probably know from your conversations with friends and maybe your personal experiences. You know this. Uh, uh, last uh, primary election that we did mostly by mail was very problematic in terms of people not getting their ballots, right. so getting their ballots late, uh, people going to uh, the five polling places that they had and having to stand in line for a long period of time. So now they're talking about having a sort of hybrid election where in Maryland everybody would get a ballot and uh, there would be some early voting and you would be able to vote in person. So it still doesn't sound like they worked out all the kinks, but they know they had a lot of uh, a lot of problems. So stay tuned for that. And then I would just uh, mention, in passing, I thought Dr. Webb was tremendous. And uh, oh, fantastic! I'm, it hoping, is. I'm hoping that uh, sounds like he's in a pretty good place in terms of money. His head's in the right place, and I guess, like Betsy said. You know, he's a lawyer and a doctor, so how impressive is that? Wow. And, uh, you know, he, he could have been an How do you do that, by the way? How, how did you get to do that? That's tough. At 37 so, years old. And, uh, yeah, 35 years old. And, you know, he couldn't be more uh, um, eloquent in talking about all the things that are going on. So we should think about how we could uh, support him. And if anybody wants to make a $20, $25 contribution today, um, that would be a good thing, but you could contribute money to his campaign, um, you know, until election day um, next, um, you know, in November. My guess is that the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee will support him, and I'm going to send a message to Jamie Raskin, who's raised quite a bit of money for congressional candidates, and see if I can get him to uh, send him a little check as well. Right. Yeah. One quick, one quick thing about the Zoom convention. Yeah, I, they have to be really careful about the security. I'm sure they're very aware, but you know, to keep these agitators out, you know, the Zoom bombers, oh, yes. crazy people. So mm -hmm. when they do the convention, I hope they have a really good security team. So my guess is that they're going to, the Maryland delegates have a separate vote on a separate Zoom conversation where there'll be a roll call and we're all pledged to Biden. So, you know, they'll be able to do that. And then the, the party chair will probably meet in another a Zoom call, which is probably on NBC and ABC and CNN and MSNBC. And they'll yeah. probably, probably try to make it as dramatic as possible. Yeah. yeah. Biden will be in uh, Milwaukee to accept the nomination. My guess, the Obamas go there too. Um, and then some other, uh, you know, dignitaries will go there as well. You know, the Clintons will go there. Uh, maybe Jimmy Carter, we don't know. But it, uh, I think it'd be pretty dramatic and it'll be on television and it won't be as interesting as people jumping up and down with their hats and their, their horn. <laughs> uh, hopefully it'll still be exciting. And I think, I think that, safe. and you all know just from reading the polls, right? Polls don't vote. 
but the polls have been very strong and supportive of uh, Biden over the course of the last right. two and essentially from the beginning of the year where he's got really almost a commanding lead in the national polls in all the battleground state polls he's doing well and then places where you didn't really expect him to do well like Texas so there's an outside chance that he could win in Texas and I have to think that all these people dying doesn't help the president's cause in the first instance. And then this story about um, the Russians paying a bounty to kill American soldiers, that yeah. can't this guy at all because he does not look like he's engaged at all in this thing. So uh, no, he doesn't know anything. He's like the so Sergeant Schultz. We need, to work, we, need to, <laughs> we need to work hard for the Senate candidates, for congressional candidates that we like, like Dr. Webb and just make sure that we can get Biden over the finish line. So that's my report. Um, we, we, had, we had some announcements from anybody else, but we kind of talked about everything else ahead of time, I think. I just, I, what I would like to do is set up the next meeting. So. <laughs> that's a good idea. I, I don't know what I'm gonna go for two weeks or. Well, we said we'd do it every two. It would be July 14th. Okay. So, July 14th? Yeah. Can you set that up, Alan? Sure. Okay. Well, Are thank we you, everybody. Thank you. Are we recording all along? All, all along here? Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Alan, for the Rosie, just streamlined, so you know. streamlined agenda, especially I loved how you put the websites so we can just go right to them when we need them. And thanks everybody for coming. And what a fantastic candidate in Virginia. Wow. Right. Absolutely. It's impressive. Is, who's okay. going to do the next meeting? Did somebody volunteer? Sure, we'll do it, Dave. I'll be recovering. Oh, surgery, yeah. so. Dale be, we'll have surgery recovery here. So. Yeah, surgery. I'm happy to attend, but I can't run it. Betsy. No, I'm working, so it's difficult <laughs> for me to juggle my work with Dan, do you problem. wanna do it? The problem is I'm uh, well, I guess I I'm having a medical procedure on the seventeenth and I've gotta get ready for that. So uh I don't know. I don't mind helping somebody, but I'm working full time Monday through Friday, but I don't oh. mind helping out somebody else who's trying who wants to do no, it. No, I'll do it. That's fine. Sure. All post, right. You want to post, if you need any help, post, Sandy, I'll help you. Yeah, I might need some help. You yeah. want to postpone it for a week? Uh, stop, man, yeah. You want to postpone it for a week? If yeah, we we do that. Do that. yeah, that would be better for me. Oh, if the 21st? Okay. 21st. That, that'll 21st. be the 21st. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. 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 21st Everybody. of July. We'll have it. Thank you, David and Keiko. Thanks. You did an excellent yeah. job. Thanks for attending. It's great, to see everybody. Yeah, great to see everybody. Maybe we'll see you in Rosie. someday. Yeah, and as soon as we have my house, house. see my Joe, Rosie. Yes, we like your background. <laughs> yeah. <Yay. laughs> right. Alan, where's your background? Alan had a nice one too. I've got I've got a background which I will uh, I will share with you before we go we go off here. Well. I've got the. Uh... Oh! <laughs> wow! I love that. That beats mine. That beats mine. That beats mine. That's good. Yours is good, Betsy. Okay. There you go. That's, That's great. great. Betsy's I've got that one too. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Yep. Have a good yeah. Bye. Fourth of July. Happy Fourth of July. Carolyn is right. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Before. yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody. See you on the 21st. Bye. I'm ending, ending Bye. the meeting for all.